Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing on this beautiful summer night? Good, good. Yeah. It's fun to do one of these in July. We don't normally do that. And so I'm excited to be here tonight with our guests and all of you. So let's begin the show. Okay, so good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Northwestern Michigan College International Affairs Forum. My name is Jim Bensley, and I'm the director of IAF. As many of you know, the IAF season usually runs through June and then begins again in September. However, this year, we have the opportunity to offer a summer program with a fantastic voice from inside the Beltway, Mr. Josh Rogan. Josh visited Traverse City last year uh, in September as a guest of the Economic Club of Traverse City. Although he was here for a very short time, he remarked that he would someday love to bring his wonderful wife, Allie, here for a visit. And as we all know, summertime in TC is pretty hard to beat, right? <laughs> so prior to introducing Josh, I would like to, to recognize a couple of people in the audience. First, Miss Allie Rogan. Allie will be speaking. Yes. <clears throat> She'll be speaking at the Economic Club on Friday on the power of vulnerability, how personal challenges can strengthen women in leadership. And if you've ever seen her work on ABC or PBS NewsHour or read her book, you know she is one who certainly does her homework and really brings a rich insight into the stories she tells. So we look forward to hearing her speak on this important topic tomorrow morning. So thanks, Allie. I'd also like to recognize Jeff Guy. Jeff, you want to? Raise your hand. <laughs> Jeff is the Vice President of the Economic Club of Traverse City. And as you know, we are co-sponsoring Josh and Allie's visit to our area. And Jeff has really been an integral part in making this all happen. So we look forward, Jeff, to be working together in the future with that sort of nice partnership with the Econ Club. Tonight's presentation will be a commentary on events currently happening around the globe. Josh won't be able to touch on everything, Wait, I take that back. <laughs> if we had four hours, I'm sure Josh could touch on everything. <laughs> However, he will only be able to hit some of the key hotspots, including Saudi Arabia, Israel, Iran, China, Russia, Ukraine, and yes, the political polarization right here in the US. As a columnist and a commentator at a number of the most highly respected media outlets in the world, Josh should also have a few insider stories to share with you as well. And true to IEF format, following the presentation, there will be some time for you to ask your questions. And now, on to tonight's headliner. Josh Rogan is a columnist, columnist for the Global Opinion section of the Washington Post and a political analyst with CNN. He is also the author of Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, She, and the Battle for the 21st Century, released in March 2021. Previously, Josh has covered foreign policy and national security for Bloomberg View, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, Foreign Policy Magazine, Congressional Quarterly, Federal Computer Week Magazine, and Japan's Ashe Shimbun. His work has been featured on outlets including NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, MSNBC, NPR, and many more. Josh has been recognized with the Interaction Award for Excellence in International Reporting and as a finalist for the Livingston Award for Young Journalists. He has also received journalism fellowships from the Knight Foundation, the East-West Center, and the National Press Foundation. Josh holds a BA in International Affairs from the George Washington University and has studied at Sofia University in Tokyo, Japan. Welcome, Josh. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for inviting me last year. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, it's really uh, nice to get out of Washington these days. And, uh, you know, when I was here last time, I, as Jim mentioned, I thought to myself, wow, this would be really great if my wife, Allie, was here. And then uh, uh, if I found out that if you come to Traverse City uh, two summers in a row, you can uh, establish residency and run for president. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that option. And uh, next year, if we come again, hopefully we'll be able to come with our uh, newborn daughter. Uh, we're expecting in November our first. Uh, to continue the tradition. Um, 
you know, we were on the Ron Jolly show this morning, and uh, Ali and I, and he asked us, he says, what's it like to, you know, have two journalists married to each other? You know, do you ever turn it off? Do you ever, you know, can you ever just not think about journalism and reporting? And, you know, I was thinking to myself, Today, I was like, actually, I've already found a scandal here in Traverse City. I've only been here a day. I got here yesterday. I found a local scandal. <laughs> Did you know that the Traverse City Cherry Festival, which we were very sorry to miss last week, uh, uses cherries that were not grown in Michigan? <laughs> the harvest is next month. The cherries are from Washington State. But I'll make a deal with, it is outrageous. But I'll make a deal with you. If each of you, buy my book within the next 24 hours, I'll let it slide. <laughs> there you go. Now out in paperback, now out in paperback. Uh, seriously though, when I first came here, I, I had just finished my first book, which I wrote during the pandemic about the US-China relationship under Trump. And uh, even last year, this was a smaller group because we had a COVID wave happening and we were still living in a, a very pandemic world and now, I'm very pleased to see that you know we can have these kinds of gatherings because we seem to be transitioning to a post-pandemic world. Uh, but I think what we're all realizing in one way or another, not just us, but people all over the world, is that, uh, and of course the variants are still spreading and the risk is still there, what we're seeing is that the post-pandemic world will not be what we were used to. It'll be something different, that we are, we're, we're entering into a, a new era that uh, will be changed from what we had expected and from what we could have planned for. It's a more chaotic world, actually, where systems and institutions and that we took for granted in our government and our society are broken and more dysfunctional, a, a more scary world in a sense where the mighty increasingly prey on the weak and where democracies struggle to maintain their character and the trust of their people and autocrats are on the march. Uh, but before I get into all of that, Good news. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about how I got here to be able to speak to you in, in front of you tonight. I started out uh, as a student in Washington, D.C. studying Japanese. Uh, that was not due to my interest in foreign policy. It was due to my interest in ramen. I just love Japanese ramen, and I figured if, I, if getting a major in it was what, what I needed to do, then so be it. I spent two years living in Tokyo. Uh, teaching English and studying there. And then I came back to DC and I worked for the Japanese newspaper, the Asahi Shibun in their DC bureau. Uh, that was because I couldn't get any other job that used my Japanese. And the first day I got there, they said to me, they said, Josh, go to the Pentagon. This was 2004. So right in the sort of early part, middle part of the George W. Bush administration. They said, go to the Pentagon. I said, why? They said, you're the Pentagon reporter. I said, are you sure? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, what do I do? They said, here's what you do. They gave me a notebook, they said, go to the briefing. Pe you may remember a guy by the name of Donald Rumsfeld. He was the Pentagon uh, Defense Secretary at the time. They said, here's your notebook, go, go early, sit in the front row. If Donald Rumsfeld, for any reason, calls on you, ask him anything about Japan, no matter what he says about Japan, that's gonna be huge news for our seven million Japanese readers. So I'm like, all right, you know, I just come back from two years of living in Japan, I'm 23 years old, I, you know, got, uh, m marched over to the Pentagon with my notebook and sat in the front row and waited for the show to begin. And, you know, two minutes before Rumsfeld comes out, uh, the famous reporters come out of the bullpen and there's this uh, very prominent journalist named Martha Raddatz at ABC News, who Allie actually worked for much later. And uh, she looks at me and she's sitting in the front row and she says, who are you and why are you in my seat? <laughs> and I thought about it for a second and I looked at her and I said, I don't see any names on the seats. And she looked at the Wrangler and she said, yeah, this isn't high school, this is the Pentagon, we don't have assigned seats. So she had to go sit in the back. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember 2004, I'm sure you do, this was a very contentious time in the war in Iraq and things were not going very well. And Rumsfeld, although you know he was the architect of that policy, he was getting a lot of incoming from the reporters, which he frankly deserved. And you know, where is Osama bin Laden? When are the troops coming home? Is the insurgency stronger or weaker than it was last time we asked you? And a, a visibly flustered Rumsfeld for, uh, just randomly saw me there and called on me and I immediately asked him a question about US-Japan relations and his face lit up. And he talked about US-Japan relations for 35 minutes <laughs> and drained the clock. 
he ran he, all the way to the bell. Until that press conference was over, it was all Okinawa basing. And I, I was thrilled. I had 35 minutes of the US Defense Secretary talking about Japan on my first day as a journalist. And the, all the other reporters were super pissed. And my bosses thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. They're like, how did you do it? I'm like, beginner's luck, I don't know. And they, I said, what do I do now? And they said, do it again tomorrow. So for three years, I was Donald Rumsfeld's foil in that briefing room. <laughs> and any time he wanted to switch the topic away from Iraq or Afghanistan, he would call me. And I would reliably switch it to US-Japan relations every single time. And we were making news twice a week in seven million Japanese newspapers that I couldn't read. And I wasn't sure if it was really, you know, a, 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 if it, the fix was really in until one day I didn't ask him anything. And, uh, you know, I, uh, for whatever reason, I didn't have anything to ask. And after the press briefing in the, outside the briefing room, he sees me. I didn't even think he knew my name. And he says, Josh, what, are you tired today? I could have used you in there. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, okay, now I got it. Now I knew, I knew we were doing this together. So after about three and a half years, I hit what I like to call the rice paper ceiling. You know, that's the, you know, l lack of upward mobility for the American kid working in the Japanese newspaper. So I took my Japanese clips and I went and applied for a job at what was then Federal Computer Week magazine covering the federal IT industry. And uh, because I sort of knew how to cover the Pentagon and I knew something about Asia, I started breaking stories on the subject of Chinese cyber warfare. And I broke enough stories that I got a call and got a better job at Congressional Quarterly where I covered the Congress at a very interesting time, maybe the mid-2006 to 2009. Uh, one of my primary responsibilities was to cover the Senate Armed Services Committee, which at that time was led by a man named Senator Carl Levin. And Carl Levin, as I'm sure you remember, was not just a, a senior senator, he was a statesman. He was uh, a part of this generation of senators and lawmakers and leaders who didn't see themselves as partisan, who didn't see themselves as uh, politicians. They saw themselves as leaders. And I, over the years, he was very kind to me, and he uh, uh, helped me to educate me and to bring me along, along with many others, including people like Arlen Specter and John McCain and Ted Kennedy and Pete Domenici and Daniel Akaka and uh, you know Ted Stevens. And you know they allowed me to travel with them all over the world and sort of took uh, the veil off of foreign policy making and helped me understand how, to, how it really worked and how it really uh, that didn't work in many times. So, you know, I, that generation is all gone. We don't have that anymore, but it was something that contributed to my uh, identity and to, as a journalist and to my ability to do the job. I then worked at Foreign Policy Magazine under the, uh, when Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was uh, in office, I then moved to Newsweek Daily Beast, Bloomberg, and now the Washington Post, where I've been for the last six years. And, you know, all throughout that time, I tried to use my interest in Asia specifically and uh, more narrowly the U.S.-China relationship to track it through a, what has been what I consider to be, a, you know, a 20-year slow but steady realization that the world that we live in, and primarily the U.S.-China relationship, which I believe to be the most important bilateral relationship in the world, has changed. That uh, the, the post-Cold War, post -Cold War era that began in 1989 and was marked by the fall of the Berlin Wall that provided 30 years of amazing peace, security, and prosperity for a lot of countries, especially in North America and Europe, uh, is over. And that we're transitioning to something new. And what that is is not determined, but we certainly have a say in it and we certainly have a stake in it. And you know, this was the premise of my reporting when I started to write the book because it seemed to me that there was an understanding over those 20 years that I spent uh, learning how to be a journalist and learning how Washington worked and policy and politics worked and international relations. There was a generational turnover, both in Washington and in journalism more specifically. And when it came to China, it was pretty clear that uh, the previous generation's assumptions, this big bet that we made on China, which that essentially, I'm boiling it down a little bit for time's sake, but the bet was essentially that if we gauged China as much as possible and invested in them as much as possible, took as much of, the, of their investment as much as possible, 
that that would cooperate with them as much as possible, brought them into our system, whatever you want to call it, the liberal world order, the rules-based system, whatever you want to call it, that that would cause China to liberalize, first economically and then politically, and then that would solve all of the rest of our problems, and we could live in peace and happiness, and everything would be wonderful. Okay, I'm, again, I'm simplifying it a bit, but not by much. This was the assumption of U.S.-China policymaking from, let's say, 1972 until, some would say until now, but at least until the, the mid-2000s. But for the younger generation of Asia hands, and I say younger a little bit, you know, tongue-in-cheek at this point, but the bottom line is that we never thought that bet was paying off. We never saw China liberalizing. In fact, more increasingly, it seemed to us that actually China was going in the wrong direction, more specifically that the leadership in China was going in the wrong direction. That rather than our engagement liberalizing China, that they were using their, our engagement against us, that they were profiting economically, but actually were trading on human rights and openness and political reform and all the rest. And this essential struggle inside the US government, inside Congress, inside our national security community, inside academia, inside the technology sector, inside Wall Street, uh, is the struggle over US foreign policy for the generation to come. And something crazy happened when I got to the Washington Post. Uh, three months after I started there, Donald Trump was elected president. And I don't know about you, but I was surprised. I know, I know for sure the Washington Post was surprised. And, you know, we didn't know what to think. We didn't know what, nobody did. How could you predict what was going to happen? Nobody thought about it. No one thought it was really going to, I mean, Donald Trump believed it, I guess, but we didn't believe it anyway. But there it was. And for that changed everything. Well, the only thing that we knew is that it would be dysfunctional. And I'm sorry, disruptive. I didn't mean dysfunctional, but it ended up being dysfunctional. <laughs> so maybe I'm Freudian slip. So, you know, in the, of course, the biggest story when Donald Trump became president in foreign policy was Russia, 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 immediately. Russia Gate, the Mueller, uh, all that stuff. And I had just started at the Washington. This is my, the biggest job I had ever had. I was like, okay, what do I do? They had 50 journalists, five zero journalists at the Washington Post covering Russiagate, 50 of them. And I was the newest one. And I was like, you know, I'm not gonna be able to compete with these 50, the great journalists, 50 journalists. So I went to my boss, Fred Hyatt, who was the opinions editor, uh, passed away recently, very fortunately. Uh, but I went to him and I said, Fred, I don't wanna cover Russia. And he's like, okay, well, what do you wanna cover? And I said, I wanna cover the China story. And he said, okay, okay, what do you need? I said, well, I need a ticket around the world, going back and forth in Asia as much as I want, and the time not to, uh, and resources to ignore this Russia story. And he said, okay, where do you want to go first? And I said, I want to go to Dharamsala, India, and meet with the Dalai Lama. And I just like, in the moment, that's what I just came up with that. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, I hope you find enlightenment. That's all he said. <laughs> And I backed out of the room before he could change his mind. So I did it. I bought a coach ticket, and then I bought another coach ticket, and then I took a, uh, one of those tuk-tuks up the mountain, and uh, you know, I got to the Dharamsala, and I met with the Dalai Lama, and I spent time with the Tibetans, and you know, I, I asked the Dalai Lama, I said, you know, what do you think of Trump? You know, I gotta know, or what do you think about this whole Trump thing, Mr. Dalai Lama? And he, I'll never forget, he, he, he laughs, he goes, <laughs> he does this laugh like, <laughs> and then he goes, well, Josh, when I first heard Trump say America first, I thought, not so nice. And then I th he paused for a second, and then he said, but I believe the American people, believe in freedom and democracy, and I trust the American people, and I have faith in America. That's what he said. I thought that was a pretty good thing to say. So I came back to Washington and started digging into this U.S.-China story as much as I could. And it, it just, it, once it grabs you, it never lets you go. And I covered Trump's, Xi Jinping's trip to Mar-a-Lago, and I covered uh, the trade war, and then the technology war, and then, you know, the, the, the Uyghur genocide, and then, uh, of course, the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, you know, this was at a time when actually the Trump administration and the Chinese government were making friends. If you remember, they had a trade war, they had a technology war, there was a lot of rhetoric. But in January 15th, 2020, that was when the trade deal was signed. Now, I get it, the trade deal 
wasn't what you know they said it was. Maybe it didn't fix the trade relationship. But anyway, that was the high watermark of U.S.-China relations in the Trump administration. January 15th, the leaders of the Chinese government, many of them came to Washington. They had a ceremony. Jared Kushner and Ivanka, everybody was there. And Donald Trump declared that this was the detente. This was the new era of cooperation in U.S.-China relations. And two days later, news of the coronavirus pandemic started pouring in. In other words, the Chinese officials had come all the way to Washington and had left. They never mentioned it. No one had asked. It had been spreading in China for weeks, but they never brought it up. And nobody on the U.S. side had brought it up either. And you know, the pandemic changed all of our lives. Of course, it changed the lives of every human being on Earth. But in the U.S.-China relationship, it really changed everything really fast. And you know, the first thing that happened is that President Xi Jinping, and this is in my book, Chaos Under Heaven, if you still available now. Um, <laughs> he, he lied to President Trump on the phone. So President Trump believed Xi Jinping when he said, oh, it's not a big deal. Uh, the coronavirus will go away in warm weather. Three days after it, President Xi said that to President Trump, Trump said on TV, he said, many people are saying the coronavirus is going to go away in warm weather. He didn't tell us many people were saying was the president of the country that is trying to hide the outbreak of the coronavirus. And that doesn't excuse any of the other mistakes that we made. That doesn't excuse bleach, shoot bleach in your butt. That doesn't excuse any of that. We made our own mistakes, to be sure. But the fact that the president of the United States trusted the president of China, who was lying to him about the pandemic, had a terrible effect, both on our politics and in our society. Then the Chinese government went around and blackmailed every country, including the United States, over the masks and the PPE. Remember, they had all of them, all those American factories. And you know, I talked to senior officials in the US government and said, yeah, they told us if we ask, if we even mention how the coronavirus pandemic started, they're not going to give us our masks. Take that if you need to. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so they, they told them, shut up about how the pandemic started, because at this time there was some discussion inside the US government about wh where did this virus come from? How did we get into this mess? Was it a natural occurrence, or was it connected to one of the back coronavirus labs in the town where the outbreak happened? And of, the Trump administration had to shut up about it because they, they, wanted, they wanted to get the masks. And that started a downturn in US-China relations that continues basically to this day. And then, of course, the Chinese government went around to all of the other countries in the world that did the same thing, first with the masks, then with the vaccines. And many countries, many democracies, uh, understood for the first time, really, what a Chinese-led world order under the Chinese Communist Party looks like in practice, that how the Chinese Communist Party intended to use its power, because, of course, they weren't using the masks and the vaccines to blackmail us to, for their economic benefit. It wasn't about money. It was about their political goals. It was about, will you recognize Taiwan? Or will you switch to recognizing Beijing? If you want your vaccines, you better dump Taiwan. That was a real example. Will you take Huawei, which is their technology company, and embed it into your 5G and into your communications? Well, if you won't, we're not going to give you your masks. And some of these countries caved. They had no choice. Some of them didn't. But overall, in democracies, eventually governments have to respond to their people. And because the people in these countries suddenly realized that our engagement with the Chinese Communist Party was now being weaponized against us, their governments had to respond. And this is part of sort of a broad awakening that is uh, still going on uh, in a lot of free and open societies. But all of that does is change the goal of our policy. No longer was it to cooperate with China, it was to protect ourselves and to figure out what it is that we have to do to set new lines, to set a new relationship where we can engage with the Chinese people, but where we don't do it at the cost of our national security, our public safety, and our prosperity and our freedom. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much. We can talk about this in the question and answer if you want, but just a quick note on the origin of the coronavirus, because I know a lot of people are still interested in it. I got you know a little bit wrapped up in this story, because at the time that the Trump administration was trying to keep this issue quiet in order to get our masks, that plan was thwarted by me. Okay, because what had happened was, in about April 2020, I, had, I got these cables, these cables, these diplomatic cables, secret cables, not classified, but secret. And basically what they said was, 
that two years before the pandemic that U.S. diplomats had a lot of concerns about these labs in Wuhan that were doing all the risky bat coronavirus research. Now, before you tweet something about me, let me just give you my full disclaimer, which is that we do not know how the coronavirus pandemic started. I don't know, you don't know, Ali doesn't know, Jim doesn't know, Jeff doesn't know. <laughs> but what had been clear to me from the very start, having written, being, been writing this book during the outbreak, is that uh, there were always two plausible theories. There were always two possibilities that deserved investigation. One is that it spilled over in nature randomly, a thousand miles away from where the bats live, but okay. And the other one is that it's somehow connected to all of the labs doing the risky bat coronavirus 10 miles from the outbreak. Those are the two theories. And I was there, I know for a fact that, you know, because of the way that the Trump administration handled this and because Tr President Trump endorsed this lab leak theory before there was really evidence of it, this got super politicized and people started to treat it as a political issue. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the, in the, in the question and answer, but just suffice to say that my message to all of you would be to be, keep an open mind because actually the origin of the coronavirus is not a political issue. It has nothing to do with politics. It's not even a scientific issue. It's a forensic issue. Something happened and we ought to find out how it happened. And you know, if you think about any disaster in human history, a, a nuclear plant melt and an airplane crash, the obvious thing to do is to figure out what happened. Because if you don't figure out what happened, how can you know what to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? So it informs our response. It's a matter of our national security and our public health. Anyway, we can get more into that if you want to. But suffice to say, the, the, the relationship was never worse than it was at the end of the, the Trump administration for all of these reasons. Because President Trump went from touting the U.S.-China relationship as a reason to re-elect him to blaming the China and the pandemic for costing him his re-election. So in comes the Biden administration. And, you know, full disclosure, I'm not a partisan guy. You know, I'm a centrist, moderate kind of guy. And I never really subscribed to either conservative or liberal or Democratic or Republican uh, um, um, membership because as a journalist, I thought I should just be an independent thinker. And that was really hard to do at the end of the Trump administration because of all of the horrible things that were going on. But I knew Joe Biden. I sort of, I've covered him for 20 years, talked to him for 20 years, like Carl Levin, like John McCain. I had a sense of the man. Uh, you know, I knew him to be a good man. I knew him to be, I, I don't know if honest is the right word, authentic, I think maybe is a better word. At the same time, I knew him to be a creature of politics and in foreign policy often to, have very particular views that didn't, I didn't necessarily agree with. So all that being said, when Joe Biden started running for president, I viewed skeptically his promise to return America to a position of global leadership because I knew that his people and his team did not understand how much the world had changed since they left office. These are people who are technocrats. They're smart, they're educated, they're, they're patriotic Americans, as are many Republicans, of course. Um, but the world that they inherited on January 20th, 2021, was completely different than the, the one that they had left when the Obama administration left in 2017. And sure enough, the Biden administration, which came in promising to fight the fight between autocracies and democracies, uh, to make human rights the center of its, his foreign policy, remember that? and to reinvigorate American alliances and restore America to a, power, a position of international leadership, I knew that it was gonna be a lot harder for them than they had bargained for. And I think that's been borne out to a large degree. And I don't wanna bash on them too much, but a little bit. And let me just take you through a couple of examples. So, Afghanistan, okay, so, you know, one of the main takeaways the, the, the Obama administration officials uh, assumed from the fact that Donald Trump was president for four years was that the American people wanted a different foreign policy. That after four decades or five decades or so of military intervention, huge military budgets, sort of the outward promotion of val American values like the democracy and human rights, but really the, the, the forceful promotion of them, that the American people had become weary of this kind of interventionism. 
And there's something to that, to be sure. What the Biden people call it is, they call it foreign policy for the middle class. You may have heard this term. It's not really, it's kind of a Rorschach test, whatever that means to you. But in Afghanistan, they made a very rational calculation, which was that Americans don't want US troops to be in Afghanistan. Of course, all the polls supported that. What they didn't calculate is that Americans, at the same time, by and large, didn't want to see the United States humiliated in Afghanistan. They didn't want to see a, a situation where we left thousands of our partners stranded. They didn't want to see a, a situation where the Taliban took over and uh, subjugated millions of women and put them back in chains after 20 years. And uh, they didn't want to see those scenes of the planes flying off with people falling off the planes. That was not part of what the polls were reading. And of course, there's a contradiction there because Americans are a little bit greedy in their policy preferences. But uh, what ended up being a play to secure foreign policy for the middle class to benefit Joe Biden's political standing ended up costing him 10 points. It was the first huge break in his popularity in his first year as presidency. It was disastrous, actually. Uh, th so then, you know, having sort of tr trying to learn the lesson of that lesson, uh, we hit Ukraine. And you have to understand that Joe Biden is, is, is well, he was head of the Foreign Policy Center Foreign Relations Committee for years. He's been doing this for 45 years. He, under, he not only believes he understands these issues, he does. Doesn't mean we all have to agree with everything, but he's an expert in his own right. And those kinds of, that kind of experience is hard to shake when you get into the new environment. So when, when the administration came in, they announced, what did they not, a policy of Russia, a policy of not resetting with Russia, because you can't say that anymore, but of stable and predictable relations with Russia. That's what they said. Um, it didn't work out, okay? And it, it, it didn't, it's not that it didn't work out because of anything that we did, it didn't work out because of what Vladimir Putin did. And this is the sort of the big blind spot, I think, in the Biden administration foreign policy, is that uh, it fails to understand that the world has changed in the sense that uh, these autocrats, these dictators, these strong men who care nothing about you know, the fate of the world, much less the dignity and agency of their own people, uh, they're much more aggressive than they used to be. They're willing, they're more, they take more risks than they used to. They're, uh, they see a world in chaos and they think that's an opportunity. And so while the Biden administration understood Russia and Ukraine in, the, in a 2016 context, they didn't understand it in a 2022 context. And that's why even though they sort of, you know, were able to see the tanks moving with the intelligence, more, mo more broadly they totally misread that situation. They misread whether the Ukrainians would fight. All right, they, that's, they misread whether the Russian army would be successful. They didn't understand that the Russian army is crap and has been eroded by decades of corruption. They didn't understand that Ukrainians were not about to hand over their country after fighting for eight years already. Now, to their credit, the Biden administration has done a lot for Ukraine. I, you may be able to tell from what I'm saying that I support U.S. support for Ukraine. I think it's our not only our moral responsibility, but it's in our interest to make sure that these uh, democracies survive and that uh, we can't allow them to be snuffed off of the face of the earth. But suffice to say, the administration has done a lot to support Ukraine. At the same time, it's still caught up in its own politics and its own biases and its own internal contradictions. Inside the Biden administration, they have their own factions. And some factions believe that if we arm the Ukrainians too much, well, then you know, Putin's going to start losing badly, and he might escalate, and we might have a war in Poland, or he might pull the nuclear button, or something like that. And this faction inside the Biden administration believes that we should arm the Ukrainians just enough to tie, just enough to keep a stalemate, which is essentially what we have. We have, you know, the lines move here, the lines move there, but essentially we're giving them just enough weapons to fight to a tie. Now, there's another faction in the administration. Uh, this faction is the one that I agree with, full disclosure that believes that that's crazy. Because if you're fighting to a tie, well, then you're uh, creating a situation where you have endless war. The war will never end. We'll just, they'll just be fighting forever. And that, of course, we want Putin to lose. And the only way to do that is to allow the Ukrainians to go on the offensive. And that's what the Ukrainians want to do anyway. And that fight is still unresolved. So in a way, the, uh, the Ukraine example is a perfect sort of depiction of the Biden administration foreign policy because it's very active, it's very aware, it's very smart. It makes a lot of sense on paper. Good processes, good people trying to do the right thing, but the results on the ground are falling short. I think that's 
I don't think I'm saying anything controversial by pointing that out. You know, on the China story, it's really interesting because, you know, when the Biden, this, it's a little bit different because the Biden and China people are pretty hawkish, okay? They're on the more, they actually agree with most of what the Trump people did, the, the Trump hawks did on China. And they came in wanting to maintain a tough position on China. And so quite different, you know, if you look at all these other things, Biden campaigned on doing the opposite of what Trump did. On China, he wanted to do almost the same thing. He just didn't want to say that. He had to call it something different. Okay, so we came up with a competition strategy. It's basically to f fix it, not nix it. And that was going fine until the war in Ukraine broke out. And now the attention of senior leaders is distracted. And U.S. is sending more troops to Europe. And uh, you know the pivot to Asia, which every administration has promised, is again being under-resourced. And the people in the region know it. I was in Singapore a month ago and they said the same thing. They said, well, you know, you keep saying there's gonna be a pivot to Asia, that it never really happens. And where's the economic side of the ledger? And what can we offer these countries in all over Asia who don't really want to do what the Chinese government tells them to do, but they have no choice because their economies depend on it. And we don't really have an answer for that. And then inside the Biden administration on China, there's different factions. And the National Security Council and the State Department, who are more uh, hawkish, are fighting against the Treasury Department and the Commerce Department, which are more business focused. And uh, they're all influenced by their lobbies. And here I'm talking about Wall Street. And in a way, it's a very similar uh, competition than we found in the last administration because it's institutional. Uh, because a lot of our foreign policy is dictated by money. And when Wall Street wants to do business in China, they pay enough congressmen to make sure that that sanctions bill doesn't go through or that, to make sure that those tariffs get lifted. And that's the way that Washington works. And on the defense side, sure, you have defense contractors and other moneyed interests, but you know, it's, it's not predictable who's gonna win the day on any given issue. And so what's that, what that has resulted in is a, essentially a stalemate in US-China relations, a stalemate in our policy. We haven't really, the Biden administration hasn't really rolled it back. The tariffs are still there for the moment anyway. I haven't checked my phone in the last 20 minutes, but let's assume that they are. And you know, we have sanctions and we have some engagement and basically it's a stalemate. The problem of course is it's not a stalemate on the Chinese side. The Chinese Communist Party is getting more aggressive, more military expansionist, more repressive internally, interfering more in free and open societies all the time and using their power to advance a, uh, uh, an or a world order that's different than the one that we understand, the one that we like, the one that we live in. An order where might makes right. An order where, you know, the ru there's not r rule of law, there's, wait, wait, what is it? There's not rule of law, there's rule by, by law. I, I screwed that up. I'll, I'll come back to you with that one. But the bottom line is that the Chinese military expansion and, uh, and, and economic expansion is, changing the world while we sort of uh, uh, tread water. Uh, what else? Let's see. Oh, yeah, Biden's in Saudi Arabia today. So that's another really good example of the, of the theme that I'm talking about. Here you had a president, again, Joe Biden knows the region. He knows it well. And he said when he was campaigning, I'm going to make the Saudi regime a pariah, not just for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, who was my colleague in the Post. I work for the opinion section of the Washington Post. He was, my, he was on our team. But not just for that, for all of the other things that Mohammed bin Salman has done since taking off, taking control, the jailing of women journalists, hanging uh, LGBT people in, for, in the town square, you know, uh, kidnapping the prime minister of Lebanon, for what reason, who knows, you know, committing atrocities in Yemen. Uh, uh, all of these things show clearly, as far as I'm concerned, that Mohammed bin Salman is of the same ilk as uh, Xi Jinping or uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is a psychotic, I'm sorry, psychopathic murderer. And Joe Biden se seemed to realize that, that th the old foreign policy where we would place our security in the hands of psychopathic murderers didn't work out. It never works out. In the long term, it never works out. Yet here he is today. Well, I guess tomorrow, it's Friday in Saudi Arabia, going to pay his respects, shake hands with the psychopathic murderer, and the explanation is, oh, well, you know, the world's a complicated place, Josh. Don't talk to us about Jamal Khashoggi. We've got to get the oil. That kind of short-term thinking is 
uh, has always proven to be penny wise, pound foolish. But there is a political imperative here. The Biden administration is uh, preaching idealism and practicing realism. And you can see that through any of all of the relationships. So that's disappointing, but kind of understandable. Uh, I want to leave a lot of time for questions. I guess I, I kind of want to close with a quote that I remember from a, a, a man that I respected, Senator John McCain. He would always say the same thing. He, was, he loved to say, he loved to quote Chairman Mao Zedong. And he would always say the same thing. He would say, as Mao would say, it's always darkest before it goes completely black. <laughs> now, what's funny about that is, of course, Mao never said that. He didn't know that phrase. He wouldn't have translated it. He wouldn't have even known what it, that it existed. But John McCain knew that. And that's why it was funny. He, didn't, he would never quote Mao, but he loved to misquote Mao. Uh, this is a, 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 a point to say that although it seems bleak, although we look around the world, we see suffering, we see uh, the, the retreat of the things that we believe in, the things that we fight for, uh, that all is not lost, that actually we do have a say and we, there is a, a way to turn it around. And the way to turn it around, of course, is to first fix the dysfunction and uh, shortcomings in our own society. In other words, in order to prove that our model, the model of democracy, freedom, human rights, the rule of law, the values that we profess to believe in, in order to prove that model is better than the alternative, the model where the party state rules, the model where the great leader or the dear leader or the crown prince gets to run every aspect of your life. In order to prove that our model is better, it has to actually be better. It has to produce for its people. It has to distribute the benefits of globalization justly and equally, and it has to be able to function without severe divisions in our politics, in our society. And that's my call for, in, for all of us, is to uh, realize that in order to, um, to to be the thing that we pr profess to be, we have to be the best, best version of ourselves. And that includes becoming a society that's more tolerant and more compassionate. Uh, and that treats people with respect, uh, both here and around the world. And that really is the only way that we can protect our security and our freedom and our prosperity and our public health. And that's not just the project of America, that's the project of all humanity. And in that spirit, I really thank you for listening and for your efforts to help me Spread that message, and I really look forward to taking your questions. Okay, looking ahead 15 or 20 years, who should we most be worried about, Xi Jinping or uh, Putin, in your opinion? Sure. Well, clearly, to, to, in my opinion, uh, Russia is the the short-term emergency in China is the long-term challenge. And we can't afford to ignore one at the expense of deal uh, dealing with the other. Uh, we have to walk and chew gum on this thing, okay? And the most important thing to realize is that uh, increasingly, both in public and private, China and Russia are working together. That uh, economically, politically, diplomatically, technology-wise, energy-wise, food-wise, they're on the same team. You know who else is on that team? Iran, North Korea, okay? Uh, the Cuban Communist Party, Maduro, right? This is, this is the team of psychotic dictators, psychopathic dictators, excuse me. And uh, we're on the other team, okay? And increasingly, those are the dividing lines that will determine uh, geopolitics going forward with, again, a, a bunch of other countries we call the other guys. You know, the Global South, the Indias, the Turkeys, who will have to be engaged on a case-by-case -case basis based on where our interests overlap and where our values overlap. And while we shouldn't put any of these countries to a direct choice, eventually I think more or less they're gonna have to choose and we should make the argument that, that, that they should choose us. But uh, to answer your question more directly, China, it's much, much worse. You know, you, you think about the size of the Russian economy, it's roughly the size of the economy of Italy. And you think about the size of the Chinese economy, it's gonna be the biggest economy in the world very soon if it's not already. Now think about a country that big that is expanding what one admiral told me while I was in Singapore is the largest military expansion in the history of the Earth. They're building hundreds of nuclear missile silos in the desert. Who, wh wh what is that for, okay? They're building an invasion force on Taiwan. We didn't even talk about Taiwan, but you know, mark my words, one, the Chinese Communist Party has the intent to attack Taiwan 
and snuff out the democracy. They just don't have the capability yet. They're not ready. They don't have enough ships to land. They don't have enough missiles to destroy everything. They're learning from the Ukraine war so they don't make the same mistakes. They're not going to make the mistakes that Putin made. They're going to make sure their banks are safe. They're going to make sure we can't sanction them, and then they're going to use overwhelming force on Taiwan such that we won't have time to get in the way. That's much, much, much more dangerous. And also, you know, while they both operate as sort of what I call sort of mafia states, right? Uh, you know, these are states that are essentially run like mafia organizations. It's like a, the Chinese Communist Party is essentially a, the biggest extortion ring there is. That's what they do. They go around to countries and continents. They say, oh, nice country you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. And if you think about that, well, it's, what if the Gambino family ran the biggest country in the world with the biggest army in the world? That's what, that's what we're facing. And at that point, Russia will become China's client state. In the last Cold War, China was the weaker partner, and, Ru and, and, Russia, and the Soviet Union was the strong. Now it's flipped. And that's not good for Russia, but that's their problem. So we're looking at a world order where, where the CCP is going to be the most powerful, richest, most evil organization that exists. And we're, we're going to be struggle to fight that without many, 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 many allies and partners around the world. And that should be the project that we should be focused on now. And uh, Russia is a subset of that problem, in my view, but uh, not one that we can ignore either. So maybe uh, linked to that in terms of allies, I have heard people in various countries interviewed with a, coming up with the idea that if, if, if we don't do something, if there aren't significant indictments and perhaps punishments that come out of the January 6th hearings, that we will lose credibility, people won't believe in our system because we seem not to believe in it. Do you have a take on that? Sure, I think you're asking two questions if I can separate them out. One is sort of, okay, what does our severe political dysfunction at home mean for our international standing? And, uh, you know, I have a, I'm, I don't mind telling, I'm an opinion columnist, I don't mind telling you that I'm of the view that, you know, armed insurrections against the Capitol are bad, that we can't have them, okay? I'm also of the view that our dysfunction greatly harms our international standing and our ability to project a leadership, much less preach to all of these countries about democracy. Can you imagine going to Turkey and being like, oh, you're, Erdogan, your democracy is not so spiffy, and all he's got to do is turn on CNN and see uh, people, you know, with, a, with a new, trying to hang Mike Pence. Okay, so so yeah, it makes us look like morons because it makes us look like we don't know what we're doing, and it endlessly feeds the propaganda of our enemies who argue that democracy is too messy and authoritarian is so much better. Uh, but the other question I think that you're asking is, what about the, all of these other countries and how do they fit in? And you know, I think that's a a different situation in Europe than it is in Asia. We, we see with the Ukraine war that we're going around the world trying to t bully these countries in uh, uh, Turkey or India. You've got to enforce the sanctions. Oh, now you've got to pay less for Russian oil. They're like, why should we do that, you know? And it's really been, an, a, 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 in a way, an example of how not to rally international support. You want to give people positive incentives, not negative incentives. And you want to find where your interests overlap and explain to them why it's in their interest to do what you want. And that's diplomacy rather than wagging your finger at a bunch of countries being like, you should do the right thing because we said so. Now, that is mu even more difficult in Asia because in a in, in, at least in Europe, and don't get me wrong, I have a lot of issues with how the Europeans have dealt with China and Russia. I'm not singling out any countries in, in particular except for Germany and France, but that's a conversation for another day. Uh, in general, these countries have bought into the rules-based international order such as we know it, and they're linked into all of our multilateral lending institutions and this and that. It's just a different story, okay? They have a different culture. They're next to China. They're not moving. And they've got a, a, essentially a monster bearing down on them. And because our credibility there was already suspect, having nothing to do with January 6th, uh, they're not about to do anything that's going to put them in the crosshairs of that monster. And it's not a, a region where they're going to have a NATO. There's not going to be a NATO in Asia. It doesn't exist. Now, what we could have is an economic NATO, but we don't have the political appetite for that here. That would be something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's politically impossible in this country, no matter what party you're in. But that would be the answer if it, that we planned, but we just can't do it. So I do think it's a much tougher problem, and it's a, uh, it, it's a real imperative to roll out some sort of economic engagement for Asia that, that convinces them that we're there to stay. And of course, in the back of all of their minds, is like, oh, well, what's going to happen in two years? 
and no, nobody, uh, nobody has the, I don't have the answer to that question. I can't assure them one way or the other. So uh, I think that we need a sustained, economic-based, bipartisan, multi-administration strategy for investing in Asia, and we just can't seem to get it done. But I'll keep writing that we should get it done. We've heard reports that uh, Saudi Arabia is maxed out for oil production. So exactly why is it that Biden's going to Saudi Arabia? Hmm, good question, good question. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think there's two, two, two things. One is that in terms of actual oil production, right, uh, my understanding is that there, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are amongst the only oil producing nations that do have some excess capacity. And maybe it's not as much as we want it to be, but it's some. Moreover, they have the, the mo more ability uh, to ramp up that capacity than other producers. So it's not a short-term problem, it's not going away, okay? So even if you start now, Ukraine war is gonna be going on a long time, it seems like. It could be a year, it could be five, it could be 10 years. So I get that there's a, a, a need to press the Saudis and the Emiratis to stabilize the energy market, but my point is, that's what they're supposed to be doing already, okay? And the last thing we should do is make concessions on the things that we believe in in order to get them to do their job. That's their job, okay? What is this U.S.-Saudi relationship really about in the first place? We provide their security, and they stabilize the oil markets. That's the bargain. So if they're not holding up their bargain, my point is what are we getting out of this relationship in the first place? But because the... Again, I'm not just blaming the Biden administration because I think other administrations have made this same mistake because we've allowed them to wag the dog and we're acting like the junior partner and they're acting like the superpower. They get to dictate to us how we deal with them and they're holding us hostage while playing footsie with our enemies. And that's because they're good at the diplomacy and we're not. So my point is, you know, what are they really threatening? Do you think Saudi Arabia really wants to you know, bet its security on Russian weapons and Chinese security guarantees? Does that seem like a smart thing? I say to them, good luck with that. Have fun trying to get a Russian, you know, fighter plane out of a Russian defense factory in the next 30 years. It's not gonna happen. So really, they need us more than we need them. But we're in this crazy situation where, because they have a ruler that's gonna be there for 50 years and we have a ruler who has to worry about the election in November, they, time is on their side. So they can say to Biden, well, you really, need me to, win, to get gas prices down now, so I'm gonna you know, use that to ring you for everything that you've got and make you uh, go against all your beliefs and you know, go hat in hand and get humiliated. That's what's gonna happen tomorrow. The President of the United States is gonna get humiliated. Oh, will he shake his hand, will he won't? It doesn't matter. He's already going there. And you're right, he won't get anything on the oil front, at least not right now. So my question is sort of, what's the real basis for that relationship? And, this is also a hard discussion to have in Washington because it leads you to the inevitable conclusion that we need a broader realignment in U.S. foreign policy and that actually President Biden was right. You know, democracies, it, it really is about democracies versus autocracies, that open societies make better partners economically, <coughs> politically, militarily, and we can't trust our security, much less our economic prosperity, to psychopaths, okay? And uh, that's what I believe, but there's no, but that's what Biden believes. He keeps saying it over and over again, but his staff doesn't believe that and the, 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 the machine of U.S. foreign policy in Washington doesn't believe that. So we, we never seem to get that. So we're caught in this endless uh, cycle of where the psychopathic murderers are able to get us to do whatever they want by dangling a little bit of oil over our heads. And that answers your question. It's not, it's not really about capacity. It's about who's the superpower and who's the client state here. And, you know, if the Saudis are going to undermine our economic security, then what, wh why are we protecting them? But that's actually a conversation that's too hard to have in Washington right now, to be honest with you. Josh, uh, a question back, going back to uh, your comment on Taiwan. Um, it sounds like you feel China going into Taiwan is pretty much inevitable. Correct. And a correlation on, how related is that to Xi Jinping, and how likely is it that he's going to be reelected in October? And Good if they go in, do you have any feel 
a little more precise and when they're just when they're ready how close are they to being ready right about no i'm just so uh, like i let me put it this way what was it three three weeks ago i was in singapore and this conference they have every year in singapore they didn't have it during the pandemic but this was the first time we had it in a few years it's called the shangri-la dialogue and this is where all of the defense ministers from all of these Asian countries, including our Pentagon defense secretary, convene and hang out and trade notes and this and that. And, uh, you know, I, uh, the, I was lucky enough to, they piped in President Zelensky from Ukraine. They're like, we've got President Zelensky. He's live on the, on the big screen in the hotel in Singapore, and he's going to take a couple of questions. And I was lucky enough to get one of the questions. And so I said, President Zelensky, you know, much like Ukraine, Taiwan is a small democracy menaced by its neighbor a dictatorship that's using historical grievances, threatening to snuff out their existence and building the means to do so. What would be your message for the people of Taiwan and for the international community? How to deal with that? And he said very clearly, he said, the time to help, he said, we can't let the aggressive dictators scoop up small countries, because those kinds of war only benefit the aggressive dictators. He said, but the time to prevent that is before the fighting starts, before the attack. He said, you can't help these small countries, these small democracies save themselves from the attack after the attack. It's already too late. That's what they're dealing with. Once the attack has happened, we've already failed. And I, th I, I agree with him. It, the, 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 it, it's not inevitable because we have a say, because there's things that we can do right now. But it's pretty clear to me and pretty clear to President Zelensky and a lot of other people that the story that we told ourselves about military deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russia wasn't true. We thought Russia was deterred. We thought they wouldn't try it. But they made a different calculation. Putin made a different calculation. That's a very similar situation with Xi Jinping. Uh, he is not deterred, OK? And what we have in place, which is a system of diplomatic agreements and security agreements and troops and stuff, that's a lot of stuff. I'm not saying we're not doing a lot. Arming, arming the Taiwanese to a degree, helping them. It's not enough. It's, not, it's clearly not enough. And when Xi Jinping attacks, we'll realize that it's too late. But we have a chance to fix that. So that's the, that's the, that's the good news. Here's the bad news. Um, you know, attacks happen when aggressive dictators combined intent, in, intent and capability. Those are the two things you need to wage war. And it was very clear to me, hearing from all of the Chinese generals at this conference, because the Chinese generals show up for, you know, at this thing, uh, that they have the intent. He said very clearly, we will reunify. Not we will peacefully reunify, we will reunify. We're gonna do it. Don't tell us, we didn't, I'm paraphrasing, don't tell us we didn't tell you. This is, you wanted a warning, this is your warning. If you intervene, we will fight you. Clear as day. That's the intent. Now, as for the capability, that's what they're building right now. So there's a, there's a military clock and there's a political clock. The military clock is when they have all the stuff. And the stuff is it's really crazy, actually, when you think about it. So what did they learn? OK, well, if we threaten the West with nuclear if, retaliation, then that will prevent the West from intervening, because we can be deterred, too. They're using deterrence against us. That's why they're building a new nuclear force. They don't need 500 new nuclear weapons. They're doing that to deter us so that when they attack Taiwan, we'll be scared that they're going to use a nuke, so we won't intervene. They're doing economic decoupling. We always talk about, oh, well, we, are we decoupling from China? Are we, is that good? Is that bad? They're decoupling from us. They're pulling in their investment. They're nationalizing all of their industries to the great uh, 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 disadvantage of American investors, but that's kind of a different story. But the point is that they're building a fortress economically. They're hoarding foodstuffs like you've never seen before, 20 times the amount of wheat, rice, cassava, soy, fuel oil, grain, all over China. They're, they're draining Southeast, Southeast Asian nations of all of their commodities to prepare for the time when we cut them off, when we try to sanction them so they won't, they'll have enough food. And then they're building a huge invasion force and a huge landing force. Once all of those pieces are in place, the military box will be checked. On the political side, the experts that I trust and the military people, that I, the analysts that I trust, uh, believe that 2026, 2027 is the natural time. Uh, Xi Jinping will be coronated for his third term this November, be the first leader in a very, very long time to outserve two terms. He's essentially making, him a, 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 making China a single ruler state, just like North Korea, 
or Russia, or you name it. Uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay, and the end of his third five-year term is 2027. So that's the deadline because he he might not get a four, fourth one. You never know. You know, there's always some meaner bastard behind you with a knife. You know, waiting to 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 knock you down. So 20 for a lot of reasons, 2026, 2027. Uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense if you're if we're if we're playing the guessing game. Now that's not a lot of time because if you wanted to give the Taiwanese the means to protect themselves from the invasion, not tanks. What are you going to do with a tank? Have you ever, ever been, been to Taiwan? It's all mountains, right? So what are you going to do with a tank? You can't drive the tank unless they invade where the tank is. The tank's a sitting duck, you know. So they don't need tanks. They need stingers and tow missiles and uh, small arms so that people can fight in the streets. All those things are going to the Ukrainians, understandably. So we need to we, we need to build make more stingers. But the factory shut down in 2005. You, you can just think of how difficult this is if we started today, but we're not starting today because we're still fighting the last war. And so it's a really dangerous situation. And uh, you know, when Hong Kong was crushed, a lot of people in Western society said, "Well, that's a Chinese city, right? That's a." I mean, it's so sad, but you know, that's their city. You know, Hong Kong is not theirs. For anyone who's been to Hong Kong, you know, whatever the nomenclature is, whatever the, the papers say, it's a country, it's a democracy, it's a vibrant one. And those people have never been ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. They're not gonna wanna be, they're gonna fight. And uh, we better help them and we better start now. Josh? Yes, I'm, 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 um, I guess I'm calling on people, go ahead. Okay, I want to go back to um, your comments a moment ago about authoritarianism and um, democracy versus authoritarianism. And I have huge concerns on that front because I think it's not only a worldwide movement right now toward authoritarianism, but the United States is certainly in that camp as well. I mean, we've been downgraded from a plus five healthy democracy by the political instability task force to a from a plus 10 to a plus five, which is, puts us basically in the anocracy zone and makes us really quite unstable. So what can we do? I mean, if we're supposed to be the shining beacon of democracy that's leading the way on this, how do we get our house in order? How do we stop this movement that's taking place right now in this country toward authoritarian rule? I'll endorse that. You. you know, only through uh, truth, accountability, and justice. Okay, and truth, accountability, and justice. Okay, the the difference between our system and the Chinese system is that we have institutions that are meant to fix things when they go wrong. We have uh, institutions that are meant to grow as society changes. And we have institutions that are meant to hold the guilty accountable and punish them uh, in the hopes that their crimes won't happen again. That's why I'm not saying it's work, It's going great. I'm not here to tell you it's going great. I'm not gonna, I can't stand here and tell you it's going well. But things like new laws and the January 6th committee and congressional oversight and the press and all of the civil society and civic engagement. I mean, the fact that I can come to Traverse City and see 100 people who are engaged politically and, 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 and active and taking time out of their lives and ignoring the beautiful scenery that I've been enjoying. You guys can't even see it. <laughs> I've been enjoying it this whole time. Uh, the fact that that exists in America is unique, really, and special. And it's not enough, but it's a, good, it's a pretty damn good start. You know, if you look at what's going on in Russia and China, they're crushing all of those things. There's no free press in Russia and China anymore. There's no civil society to speak of. There's no NGOs. You know, there are lawyers, there are people who are struggling, but every day they risk going to prison. So we have the capacity to grow and change and reform. I'm not saying today it's, it looks good, but that's, that, that, that's the only answer to your question, is that uh, to prove that our system is better, it has to be willing to openly and forthrightly account for its errors. And no, we haven't done that in a stellar way over the last few years, or maybe you could say ever, but that's the path. That's the only, that's really the only answer that I can honestly give you.
Yeah, no, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm forced to stubbornly agree with you. It's not just that, it's that uh, education, civic education is down. Uh, I, I'm not going to blame myself or my wife for this, but media literacy is down. Uh, the responsibility of our institutions, including the media industry, have, has, has really fallen off. It's a, it's a real shame. I, I can't fix it. I can just do my job and, uh, and, and hope that I survive in what's an increasingly chaotic environment. But you're absolutely right. Our, the, the guardrails that, that saved our democracy and when it was stressed are severely dented. And they, they probably couldn't take another crash. That's, um, I can't sugarcoat that for you. I can't, I can't tell you that that's not a very serious threat to our way of life. It, it certainly is. But it, again, I'm heartened to see that there are so many people just in this one room, for one example, that are committed to making sure that doesn't happen. Thank you for that very important question. Uh, we have about, we have time for maybe one more. So we'll take her over here. Thank you. Going back to the um, issue about why Biden is in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel, uh, don't you think that he's not only a politician but a statesman and that there is a distinct possibility that uh, Iran, with its nuclear weapons, <clears throat> can not only be, well, can be dangerous to those two countries and he's, Biden is also a negotiator. And don't you think that some of that was going on? I hate to think that we aren't sure why he's there because there has, has to be good reasons or he wouldn't be there. Yeah, I, I think you make some good points, uh, honestly. Um, let me try to Thank apply uh, uh, to your question an analysis that's rooted in what's going on inside the Biden administration, because I think it might uh, square the circle. It might explain why, why you're saying is absolutely right, but why my opinion, I think, is also absolutely right. Um, inside the Biden team, you've got two, diff two completely different visions of what U.S. policy and presence in the Middle East ought to be. Okay? On the one hand, you've got people like Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Okay? Uh, he was the stepson of a Holocaust survivor named Samuel Pissar. Okay, he was raised in the uh, uh, the tradition of the post World War II Enlightenment. The idea that the path of humanity and democracy and society should roughly follow the course of what we consider Western Enlightenment. From, the, from Descartes to Spinoza to Thomas Paine to Thomas Jefferson to Darwin to Orwell. And he's, his foreign policy is rooted in that idea. On the other side, you have, a, it's, it's, it's kind of an idealist, if you'll say. Some will say internationalist, some will say small l liberal. Not liberal in the pro democratic sense, liberal in the, we believe in liberal values should be the, the core of human interaction and the core of our aspirations as a, government as a society. I, I share that view. I don't think I've been shy about it. I'm well established as being someone who believes that that is really the only way to approach these countries to both on a moral level to support the people living there and on a strategic level to, it, to nudge them towards better outcomes where they become better partners and better members of the international community, although again, I'm not saying it always goes well. On the other side of the ledger, you have a realist contingent inside the Biden administration. On this issue, it's led by a guy named Brett McGurk. He's the senior coordinator for the Middle East and the National Security Council. And he has always been of the view, and many people in the administration share this view, and they, it's an honest view, one that I disagree with, uh, that no, actually the priority is short-term stability. And that the best way to ensure that short-term stability is by focusing on our relationship with the governments in these countries, not the people. And if those governments are dictatorships, so be it. And this is considered not a liberal, small l liberal approach to foreign policy theory, it's a, a realist approach. And you know that, tr that has its own tradition and its own advocates. Again, it's one I disagree with, but it's not crazy. And if you believe in that, then it makes perfect sense for Biden to do exactly what he's doing, which is to engage these dictators, see what we can do with them. Because we do have shared interests. Iran is a great one. They'll say, oh, well, Yemen or, we want to push Israel close to the Gulf countries, or we need the oil, or there are several, several things that 
we could do business with these dictators on. I get that. And it's not as if these two ideas are completely mutually exclusive. So if you're of that camp, and as the, the National Security Council Senior Director Brett McGurk is, that the best we can do is to put Band-Aids on all these countries and work with them to see what we can get out of them and not really worry about the people that are living under these dictatorships, because that's their problem, not our problem. Well, then, yes, uh, you know, everything that Biden is doing this week makes perfect sense. But my point is, what did he really get for it? And do, did that actually work? It sounds good in theory, but does it work in practice? And when he comes back next week, what will he have to show for it? Okay, I went there, I met with the dictator, we went with human rights, we put that to the side for a second, we have the shared interest in Iran. Did he get anything on Iran? Did they agree to do anything? Did they get any, they didn't get the oil? Did he do anything to normalize with Israel? Did he do anything? No, he basically got nothing. Now it didn't get any worse, it didn't, it didn't get any better, but it's sort of shuffling around the, the atrocities and the problems. And that might be as good as we can do. If you have that mindset that that's the best we can do in this crazy world, then fine. I, for some crazy reason, have a higher aspiration for a world that's more just and more humane and that focuses more on the dignity of individuals and not the interests of dictators. Uh, but clearly my view is not winning the day, so I guess we'll have to wait until the next president comes along and see if they can do any better. Thank you for your question. Josh, thank you so much for your insight into the political complexity of the world in which we live. Uh, it's been very, very, as I say, very insightful, very informative. So thank you, thank you for coming to Traverse City and doing just that. Mm -hmm. And thank to, thanks to all of you who are here tonight and to those who have re-upped their membership. We encourage you to do that. TCIAF.com is the place to make that happen. Uh, make sure you check your e-news. We've got a lot of things coming down the pike. In fact, we'll be releasing our fall schedule sometime in August, so watch for that. Uh, please contact us if you have any suggestions or concerns. We're always available for that. And we look forward to seeing you in September. Uh, also, remember, if you're walking around Traverse City this summer and you happen to stop into one of our local bookstores, please pick up a copy of Chaos Under Heaven <laughs> by Josh or Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss by Allie. The, uh, the books will be there. We encourage you to do that. We do have uh, one uh, copy here that we are going to give away. We're going to do a little drawing. We will find you uh, as we look at the numbers that we have in the hat, so to speak. And uh, we... Hope you read it and obviously get a lot of information from it. I know you will because I have read it myself. So, again, thank you all. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you in September. <laughs>